Hi, my name is Sean Conlon, and I'm an associate investigator in the microbial genomics section at NHGRI. And today I'm going to be talking about the microbiome in general, um, and probably about half of my talk is going to be specifically on the human microbiome, which is sort of the more famous of the microbiomes. Um, but hopefully I'll have convinced you by the end of this that there are lots of places where microbial communities are, are important uh, to, to life in general. Um, so the, the microbiome is made up of lots of different organisms. And so what you can see here are some pictures, uh, mostly micrographs of different organisms that um, you might think of as being in a, in a microbiome. So in the upper right corner is a, is a Staphylococcus. Uh, there's some fungi, uh, there's mites, there's viruses. That's what that sort of large particle in the middle that actually probably a lot of people recognize now as, as a viral capsid. Um, and so all of these things contribute to the microbiome, even though bacteria tend to be what we think of. Um, and so in today's talk, I'm going to, uh, in my introduction, I'm going to uh, talk about the microbiome, uh, the sort of main tool that we use to look at the microbiome, which is uh, DNA sequencing, um, a little bit about the bioinformatics of how we um, analyze those sequencing data and visualize them. And then the second half of my talk is really going to focus on the human microbiome in, in health and in disease. And, and this is going to come from the perspective of the microbial genomics section that I'm part of, where our model system is really skin. Um, so that's a little different from, if you're familiar with uh, the microbiome literature, um, a lot of the microbiome literature is on the gut. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that, but we really focus on the bacteria that live on the skin. So um, sort of at the beginning of my, my introduction is sort of what is the microbiome and how do we study it? And uh, these are some sort of common microbiome sources uh, that you might not think of when you think of the microbiome, but they are, they are important. And so... Um, in the middle of the, the screen is a, is a SCOBY, I forget what that stands for, Symbiotic Community of Bacteria and Yeasts, I think, which is, is how you make kombucha. There's yogurt, there's cheese. Um, and these are all important microbial communities to sort of food manufacturing. And actually, as I'll, I'll describe in a moment, uh, the cheese is actually a really excellent model system for understanding um, ecology and succession in microbes. Um, and then I have the soap up there in the upper upper left hand corner, just sort of sort of remind me that you know in popular culture nowadays, you, it's really popular on TV and commercials to hear that soaps are gentle on your microbiome. I, I think that probably remains to be seen whether that's true or not, but it just goes to point out how how much the microbiome has kind of entered the popular sort of uh, mindset. Um, and so these are some more examples of of uh, places where you might have seen um, microbiome in popular culture. Um, this gut check game is a board game that you can play that you basically play um, microbes in the gut and you're picking up plasmids and doing all kinds of um, different things in the gut. Um, Ed Yong's book, I Contain Multitudes, is a very accessible book about the, microbi uh, the microbiome. And then um, there's lots of um, uh, uh, sort of citizen scientist projects out there now because uh, collecting microbes is a fairly accessible thing to do. Um, but with all of this popularity and accessibility comes um, overhyping of the microbiome. And so what I have here are some examples, most of them taken from uh, Jonathan Eisen's blog um, on sort of overhyped microbiome. Um, and there's probably a little bit of science behind all of these headlines, but um, in general, these are overinterpretations of the microbiome where um, some, some correlation, some, some correlated thing that was, was discovered in the microbiome correlates with a phenotype like athletic performance or something. And the, they haven't proven causation. They've simply shown that, you know, for instance, with the, the bottom one about the cycling, that, that Prevotella may be important for, um, you know, maybe an important marker of, of athletic diets or the athletic gut. Um, like I said, could be, could be some science here, but for the most part, these are very overhyped um, interpretations of the microbiome. So what, what is the microbiome? And I already, I already uh, touched on this earlier. It's, it's bacteria, it's metazoans, it's fungi, it's viruses, and it's really anything that sort of lives in these communities. Um, and I'm gonna use sort of a general term of metagenomics, which is, you know, uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, um, most of the time when you talked about sequencing something, you were sequencing an isolated organism. So you would take a bacteria and you would sequence its DNA, or you would sequence a human genome or you would sequence a, a, a fungal genome. And metagenomics is the idea of sort of interrogating an entire sample to look at the, the entire composition of the sample. And it's, it's very fundamental to how we look at microbiomes, how we take a census of what organisms are living there. Um, and so 
these are some famous environmental microbiomes that you might not be as familiar with, but they really, they really kickstarted a lot of what we know and a lot of the techniques and, um, and uh, sort of frameworks and models that we use to study uh, microbiomes in, in a lot of other um, uh, environments. So the first one uh, on, the, on the left-hand side is an acid mine drainage, and this was made famous by Jill Banfield's lab. And the reason it's an interesting microbiome is that because acid mine drainage is so toxic and the pH is, is so acidic, uh, very few things can grow there. So it actually makes an excellent uh, simplified reduced model for understanding the microbiome. You know, on the other side is the Global Ocean Survey, which Craig Ventner basically took a boat around and sampled uh, places like the Saragossa Sea. And even though the microbiome is somewhat dilute in the ocean, they took liters and liters of organisms and um, spun them down or filtered them out and found a whole huge amount of, of diversity in the ocean. So everything from uh, lots of different bacteria, cyanobacteria, and then viruses, phages, that are, are mostly associated with the bacteria. Um, so these are two very famous examples of sort of environmental microbiomes that really shape the way we look at microbiomes. Um, I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, we all like cheese or many of us like cheese. And part of what gives cheese its flavor and, and all of its, the think properties that we like about cheese is that it, there, there are microorganisms that are in there doing chemistry. Um, you know, we think of it as, may think of it as food science, but it really is chemistry and it really is getting down into the physiology of what the bacteria are doing. It's actually an excellent model system for understanding those sorts of things, how bacteria are involved in the conversion of um, one molecule to another, but also in things like succession where you might, with cheese, you might start out with one community of microbes early in the, um, early in the cheese making process, and then that evolves over time and the, the composition of bacteria and fungi change over time. And that's actually um, not a bad um, analogy for what happens with humans, where the, the human microbiome develops from infancy, infancy to adults. And so Rachel Dutton's lab does, does some really nice work using cheese as a, as a model system um, to understand sort of bacterial fungal interactions. Another uh, really interesting um, Thing that you may not have, have heard of, but is um, is a really cool system that uh, Margaret uh, McFall and the guys lab works on is these uh, these little squids um, have light uh, organs in them, which basically uh, the the thought is that um, when they're out hunting at night, these light organs glow and produce light below the the squid, which basically erases its shadow. Um, and so when they're hunting, they don't form they don't they don't create shadows. That's that's the I'm not, I'm not entirely sure if that is, if that's proven hundred percent, but that is the, the accepted reason for why they have these light organs. Uh, but they don't produce the light themselves. Actually, that light is produced by a bacteria called Vibrio fischeri. And there's a really amazing cascade of biochemical processes that allow these squids to select one individual Vibrio fischeri out of the water column into this light organ where it then grows up into a colony and is able to glow. Um, and so this is this is a very simple microbiome in some ways because it's really it's a monoculture of one organism that this fun, that this uh, squid has has picked up uh, to to use for this purpose. Um, and when as far as the, uh, the human microbiome goes, these are two very colorful pictures um, of ways in which people have tried to visualize the spatial orientation and sort of organization of of bacteria. Taking the picture on the on the right first. This is sort of a, um, uh, a look at, at the diversity. So how many different and how varied the communities are at different parts of your body, where the, the redder it is, the more uh, diversity and variation is, the bluer it is, uh, the more sort of simple the communities are. Um, and this is at the, at the level of, you know, centimeter level on the skin. On the, on the left-hand side are actually some very complicated micrographs of organisms from dental plaque. And so these are actually structures that are built up of bacteria in your mouth, um, where they'll have uh, each bacteria is colored a different color using a, a, a probe. And so what you can see is all of these different amazing little structures where there'll be green bacteria on the inside with orange bacteria on the outside. And those represent different species of bacteria that form these structures. Um, and so this is, you know, this is a non-sequencing way to look at the, the structure and sort of um, distribution of bacteria in, in these little structures. So um, 
I've already talked about it a little bit in the previous, previous slides about how do we observe the microbiome? How do we figure out what's there? Um, and, and a lot of it isn't using the microscope that's in this picture. I mean, that's, that's really for sort of very simple, um, looking sort of very simple um, slides and things like that. Most of the time, what I'll be talking about is, is, is sequencing. Um, and this is a, a slide that gets used a lot in HGRI that sort of shows the cost for a genome as a function of time, so years are on the bottom. And all you really need to know is that um, the cost of genome sequencing has come down a lot over the years, and it's actually now very quite affordable to sequence human-sized genomes. And while bacteria themselves individually have genomes that are, you know, many, many, many times smaller than the size of a human genome, um, in, a, in a metagenome or in a sample, there are many of those. And so we actually need to sequence them quite deeply. We need to sort of gather a lot of sequencing data in order to be able to really enumerate all of the different bacteria, fungi, and viruses that are in a sample. So um, the, the advances that have been made for sequencing human genomes have been a huge boon to the microbiome community because uh, it really allows us to get in and, and really take apart these samples um, at the sequencing level. Um, so how, you know, nuts and bolts, how would this actually work? Um, so in our lab, we might do something where we'd, we, would, we would call in a, a, either a healthy volunteer or um, uh, we also work on um, atopic dermatitis as a, as a disease. And so we might have a study where we're, we're looking at somebody who has atopic dermatitis. Either way, we'd bring that person in, um, usually take a swab that's been moistened with some sort of a, of a buffer and use that to swab their skin. That's then put into a, a, another tube of buffer. Um, we run a number of molecular biology um, protocols on that, that essentially convert those long strands of DNA into small pieces of DNA that are, are tagged in such a way that the sequencer can see it. And then we sequence those in a massive way on a, on a sequencing instrument, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then bioinformatically, um, we, we can do a lot of things with those sequences. So we'll, we'll convert a, a single sample from the skin into say, you know, 50 million sequences, and then we can take those sequences, we, we can do some quality control and trimming on them, we can remove the human because um, part of what we get when we swab humans is that we get some of their cells. And so we'll end up sequencing part of their genome and that's not part of what we're interested in. So we'll typically subtract that host DNA. And then we'll use things like public databases to take those, all the rest of the sequences and say, okay, well, where did this sequence come from? Did it come from a bacteria? Did it come from a fungi? Did it come from a virus? Um, and so there, there's at least two ways that our lab looks at uh, the diversity of sequences. We either will use amplicon sequencing or metagenomics or sort of what they call shotgun metagenomics because um, you basically with shotgun metagenomics, you're shearing the DNA up into lots of little pieces and kind of sequencing everything. Um, amplicon sequencing, which is what's shown on the left, is a way of looking at marker genes. Um, and so every bacteria, so, and it's really, a way to it's really a way to interrogate single kingdoms. So with amplicon sequencing, you can look at all of the bacteria in a sample, but not the fungi or the viruses. Or you can look at all the fungi, but not the bacteria and the, the viruses very easily. And, and viruses generally are not looked at using amplicon sequencing because they don't have a common marker sequence. But taking as an example bacteria, bacteria have a common marker that's called a, a 16S ribosomal RNA. It's, it's very well conserved. It's, it's necessary and it has parts that are, are folded up in, as part of the ribosome. And so they, they don't change very much evolutionarily. And the changes that they do pick up um, tend to give us markers for how bacteria are related to each other. So they allow us to make a, 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 a phylogenetic tree or a tree of life. Um, and so we can amplify those sequences using PCR, sequence those, and then use those essentially as tags or as barcodes to figure out what organisms were in there. Um, it doesn't tell us as much because knowing, knowing that you had you know, 5,000 sequences associated with Staphylococcus aureus does tell you a piece of information, but it doesn't necessarily tell you about what strains of Staph aureus in there or um, what plasmids they have or what um, antibiotic resistance genes they have. It simply tells you that something from that bacterial taxa is there. Um, metagenomics, which is shown on the right, is a lot more comprehensive. It's, it's more expensive and the, the, the analysis is more difficult, but you get everything. So instead of just sequencing those little marker genes, we literally shear up the whole, all the, all the DNA in the sample into small pieces and sequence all of it. But what you get out of that is something like if you were to take multiple jigsaw puzzles and dump them together. We have lots of pieces and we have to 
we have to sort those out um, computationally later if we want to try to put them back together as genomes. That's actually something that's um, a fairly uh, a big advancement in the field right now is that people are, are taking these um, heavily sheared up fragment, fragmented uh, DNA samples and actually putting the, the bacterial genomes back together again to get what they call mags or meta genome assembled uh, genomes. Um, yeah, most of what I'm going to be talking about today is not going uh, the step of trying to reconstruct the genome. We're just asking, you know, what genes are there and based on those genes, what bacteria are there. Um, so a little bit about DNA sequencing. A lot of people are probably already familiar with this, um, but you know, DNA is a, is a double helix. Um, there are bases on each strand. There's a Watson strand and a Crick strand or a, a sense and an anti-sense strand, and those encode um, the genes that, uh, that are eventually transcribed into RNAs and, and are all the instructions for building a cell. Um, and so reading that DNA sequence um, has, is, is a huge industry, and there have been huge advances over the last 20 years that have taken us from being able to sequence you know, 96 samples or 96 sequences on, on a run to being able to sequence you know, billions and billions and billions of sequences in a run. Um, and so something like the, the Illumina MySeq DNA sequencer, and I'm, I'm not in any way associated with this company. This is just one of the companies that makes DNA sequencers. Um, that, that instrument can take samples that have been prepared in a specific way and give you back all of the, the sequencing data. And without getting into all of the details, the way, way it works is it's basically your, your sequences um, that you're interested in, in knowing. Uh, we uh, put little adapters on either end of those, which cause them to stick down to, to essentially a glass cell. Uh, our glass, think of it as a glass slide. Um, and then we can watch the addition of bases to those as basically as we, as we synthesize the, the other strand. And as those light, basically as those, those spots on a, on a plate change colors, we can say that an A was added, a T was added, a C was added, a G was added. Um, and as you watch that with a camera, you can then reconstruct the sequence of uh, whatever, whatever was in that spot. Um, and these are actually relatively short for DNA sequences. So they're on the order of uh, you know, anywhere from 50 to 200 bases, say. Um, but they're very accurate. There are also technologies that allow us to sequence very, very, very long sequences at, at lower accuracy. And so the two of those technologies are the nanopore technology, which I won't have time to get into, but is, but is essentially um, a way to take a, a small piece, of, a, a long strand of DNA and pull it through a membrane and essentially watch it as this, as this sequence goes through a membrane, transmembrane pore, um, watching the voltage changes. And those voltage changes tell you about the sequences that are currently in the channel. Um, and then there's also a technology that actually, in a lot of ways, is very similar to the way I described for the Illumina technology, where you're essentially watching bases being added, but it's it's at a single uh, a single uh, molecule level, and that's um, that's uh, the the PAC Bio instrument that we use to sequence, for instance, bacterial genomes uses this technology. So in our toolkit for looking at um, metagenomes and genomes, we have these sort of two technologies: very short read sequencing, where we can sequence. High ac highly accurate but short sequences massively in, in massive amounts. And then we have technology that allows us to read longer sequences, but fewer of them and with lower accuracy. And using these two technologies, we can learn a lot about microbiomes. Um, this is a, an older slide, but it's just a very quick, um, it give you an idea of if we were doing um, some sort of um, epidemiology, we were trying to find out about, say, a disease causing organism, what are some of the methods that we can use to look at a a, uh, a disease causing organism in a sample and sort of how long would they take. And so things like um, PCR, where you may have a, um, an assay for an organism, you might be able to do that in two hours versus sequencing the entire genome um, going from you know, the plate to the complete genome might take you two weeks. And so we apply these different technologies. When I get to the end of my talk about, we start talking a little bit more about um, sort of bad bugs. Uh, we apply these technologies um, as needed to get whatever sort of time and and uh, sequencing resolution we need, because you know we get a lot more information from the right hand side of the slide, but it takes us longer. We get less information, but it, we get it a lot quicker from the, the left hand side. Um, other sort of omics technologies that people use to look at the microbiome um, include transcriptomics, which is looking at the the actual RNAs that are transcribed from the genes. 
Um, because, you know, looking at the, just the genomics, looking at just what's in the genome tells you what the bacteria can, what genes the, gene, what genes the um, bacteria has, but it doesn't tell you whether they're being expressed or not, whether they're, they're actually making that product. And transcriptomics helps you get at that. Um, culturomics is a kind of large scale um, culturing of bacteria under different conditions. Um, proteomics is looking at the proteins in a cell um, or a sample, and metabolomics is looking at the small molecules. Um, and these are all different complementary methods. Um, most of them still, there's still a genomic component to it, but then people will try to combine it with one of these other omic methods. Um, so bioinformatically, um, you can imagine that when we do all of the sequencing, we get, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of sequences. Um, there, there's a, a lot of computational um, effort that's required to, to take that and convert it into essentially um, observations into sort of phenotypes and things you can follow up on. And a lot of, a lot of microbiome work is what we call hypothesis generating. We're not, we're not always going in with a specific question in mind. Rather, we're going in to characterize a system that we're interested in, and a lot of times that characterization will, will uh, create hypotheses that we can then go on and test in the lab. Um, but one of the most sort of basic concepts that we um, are interested in when we look at sequencing data is the, the concept of diversity that I, I mentioned earlier. So on the, on the left-hand side is a low diversity environment, right? Those fish all look the same. It's all the same kind of fish, um, and there's lots of them. On the right-hand side, there's a sort of a coral reef, and there's lots of different um, fish. And you can imagine that microbiomes can be the same way. You can either have uh, microbiomes that are very low diversity. So for instance, uh, your back or your forehead tends to be um, heavily dominated by a type of bacteria called acutibacterium uh, acnes. They used to be called prote uh, uh, propionibacterium. But that's the dominant bacteria in that, in that community um, versus um, say the palm of your hand, which in addition to being kind of a, an unusual site, it's also a site that we talk about having a sort of high transient burden. So there are things on your hand from touching surfaces. So um, those tend to be sort of very high diversity. There's lots of different bacteria and different abundances. And we have all of these different estimators. That, an example that I have at the bottom that's actually not really used very much in, in real research because it's, it's, it's kind of an older estimator, but it's very easy to explain is called the Chow One estimator. We were basically just counting up the number of species you observe and, and adding to that a, a, a modifier that has to do with the number of species you've seen exactly once or the number of species you've seen twice. And those are, those, the, that modifier is in there to account for the fact that um, if you've only ever seen an organism once or twice, it may mean that you haven't sequenced deeply enough. Um, if, you have, if you've sequenced a, a sample so deeply that you've seen everything multiple times, that means you've probably sequenced it sort of to completion. But if you're still seeing things only sequenced once, then that means you probably, there's still un, un, unidentified diversity in that sample. And this estimator helps you kind of um, get at that. Um, more commonly, uh, we tend to have different ways of visualizing our microbiome data. So on, on the left-hand side is a, is a fairly, um, cart almost cartoonish, but it is based on real data. Um, image that we, we put out a long time ago that sort of shows uh, what, what organisms live on different parts of the body. And what you can immediately tell is that the oily sites like your forehead and, and uh, the side of your nose and the back of your ear and your back, um, those are dominated by these kind of blue colors, which are actinobacteria. Um, and they're known to like these sort of oily sites. Um, and so it's very easy to see it at, that kind of at, at a glance. Um, and a more common way to see it is in the upper uh, right-hand corner, you'll see these sort of bar charts where we kind of break it down and say that, you know, if, if, we, if a bar represents 100% of the bacteria, what percentage are associated with each different um, taxonomic um, group? And then on the bottom is another fairly common um, way to display lots of samples where um, we take the data that you, would, that you would get from one of these bar charts essentially and compare two samples and say, okay, well, how similar are they together? And as you plot them on one of these, what's called, it's either an ordination or in this case, it's a principal components analysis. Essentially samples that have similar microbiomes are going to be next to each other in space. And so this, um, this one is colored by where the samples came from. And you can see that all the orange oral samples cluster together and all of the gastrointestinal samples cluster together. Um, and so it's not all that surprising that the microbiomes from these different skin environments um, form distinct clusters, but you can imagine um, 
in a, in a more investigative sense, if you had samples that were, say, from pre and post treatment with antibiotics, you could see if, you know, after antibiotics, do the samples pre and post cluster together, or do they separate out? And if they separate out, that tells you about that, what sort of a, a perturbation you're applying to the system. So this is like a, this is a kind of a summary of, of some of the different ways that we show microbiome data. And you'll see some more examples later on. So now I'm going to get to the, to the human microbiome, and I'm going to start talking about um, the sort of the healthy human microbiome, or, or at least um, understanding it in terms of um, how the microbiome impacts different systems in the body. Um, and so it's, it's a fairly common trope that's thrown out there that there are 10 times as many bacterial cells in and on the human body as there are human cells in the human body, and that's, that's because bacterial cells are much, much smaller. Um, and and that's, that number has sort of been disputed, but it's, it's, it's not really disputed that, um, that the number of genes encoded by the bacteria that live in your gut, on your skin, um, and, and, and around your body, um, encode many, many, many genes, thousands, tens of thousands of genes. And that these, these enzymes and these genes, the, these gene products are very important to human health. And just to give you a couple of examples, one of them is that some of the oligosaccharides that are in breast milk are actually not, there's not a, 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 an enzyme in the human body that digests, that really digests them well, it can break them up. But there are microbial, um, there are microbes that are able to um, break up these oligosaccharides. And it's thought that this is a symbiosis that's developed over the years that essentially you're cross-feeding this, um, this microorganism. Also, um, the microbiome plays an important role in lots of drug um, metabolism. Um, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Um, oftentimes we think of it in terms of, um, of the sort of unintended consequences. And one example I have here um, that's, um, I think, believe from Dr. Balskis's lab is that um, uh, the, the drug that's used to treat Parkinson's is actually metabolized in the gut. And depending on the extent to which it's metabolized in the gut, that can actually impact the, effect, the uh, efficacy of the drug. Um, and so understanding how the microbiome is, in, is, is sort of doing chemistry for us and, and sometimes um, in, in ways that we don't expect is important. And it also contributes, it's been shown to contribute to lots of other different systems and disease processes within the body, including cancer, diabetes, um, obesity, and, and others. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the lab that I am part of, um, which is run by uh, Dr. Julia Segray, and our, our uh, collaborator, Dr. Heidi Kong, we really study um, the, the microbiome in terms of the skin microbiome. And um, we have at least sort of two arms to our, our lab. One of them is, as I said, the skin microbiome, where we're really interested in sort of host genetics, the microbiome and the immune system. And there's lots of diseases that we're, that we're interested in that perturb one sort of leg of the stool. Um, atopic dermatitis, um, wiscott aldrich syndrome, doc 8 syndrome, um, so like, for instance, DOC8 syndrome is a, is a, uh, a immune disorder uh, that uh, has a very strong effect on the viral microbiome. And so by perturbing the immune system, we can now look at that effect of that on the microbiome. Um, and then in the hospital epidemiology side of things, um, we're interested in sort of the genomics of um, antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, and in both cases, um, we do studies um, with, with patient cohorts, but also um, model systems like mouse. Um, this is a fairly famous sort of um, microbiome uh, picture that came from the original um, Human Microbiome Project papers in 2012. And the main reason I have it up here is to show you this, uh, what I was talking about is sort of what the bacteria do for you. Um, and if you look at, uh, at, at Panel A, where you see all of these different phyla, so these sort of large um, bacterial groups. So these are the these are the highest level bacterial groups um, there are. You can see that there's quite a bit of diversity um, in how much blue or red or yellow there is. But if you look at B, at the metabolic pathways, um, these are instead instead of being colored by what bacteria they're coming from, they're just colored by what their function is. So what do they do? What are the um, what is the biochemical sort of repercussions of these pathways? And you can see that those are much, much more stable. And this is a huge, in my opinion, a huge um, uh, conclusion from the Human Microbiome Project is that, you know, uh, the microbiome itself might be quite varied as far as composition, but what it's doing there tends to be very well conserved. Um, in, in our lab, 
uh, one of the more striking examples of a microbiome, of a change in microbiome, um, was this study uh, from 2012, where we looked at the skin microbiome as a function of, of age, and more specifically tanner stage. So if you're not familiar with that tanner stage, uh, staging is, um, is a measure of, of how far um, young men and young women are through puberty. And so tanner stage one is basically um, you know, toddlers or very, very young children. And uh, Tanner stage five is basically adult. And there, uh, a clinician can essentially evaluate what, what Tanner stage somebody is in. And you can see that there's a very clear demarcation in this top bar chart um, of the composition of, uh, of the bacteria inside the nose. This is actually, that's the, where the samples came from. Going from very young children, and you can see the ages on there, um, two years old, three years old, five, seven, um, up through, um, through older, um, older folks. And um, this, this is such a dramatic change, and it's, and it's mirrored on the skin as well, where um, children are thought to sort of have very, what, they, what we call streppy skin. They have a lot more streptococcus on their skin. And adults or teenagers and adults have more propionibacterium or cutibacterium. Um, and this, this is, there's a lot of reasons for this, but you know, one of them is that as, as, you, as you age, your skin goes from goes to being more oily. And these oil-loving bacteria like cutibacterium or, or carinibacterium go up in abundance. And so this is a very clear example of the microbiome um, changing in response to, to human physiology. Um, this is just another uh, quick example of, of a study that we did looking at the interplay between fungi and bacteria on, on uh, the human body. And so in this example, um, what you're looking at is essentially uh, richness, which when I was showing you earlier that Chow one estimator, this is a similar idea. So it's, it's how diverse um, are, the, are the fungi or the viruses on the body. And what you can see is that um, for the plantar heel, the toe web, and the toenail, which are all on the foot, um, there's a fairly high fungal diversity, but relatively low bacterial diversity. And that's reversed for the hands and the arms. And then the, 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 the shades of kind of beige and pink, those are all on the trunk or the head. Those sort of have um, lower, lower diversity overall. As I mentioned, one of the, the conditions that we study in lab is atopic dermatitis. And this is a, a, a dry, itchy, um, almost looks like a rash that's typically manifests on the backs of the knees and the insides of the arms. Um, for some people, it's, it's annoying. For other people, it's actually, it's actually quite serious and can, can pretty severely impact their quality of life. Um, and the, the kids that we work with tend to be um, in the more severe range. Um, so for them, it's very serious. And it also, um, <clears throat> atopic dermatitis is part of what they call the atopic march, which um, involves uh, this condition oftentimes will then lead to things like hay fever and asthma. So it's an important condition to understand. And uh, what we discovered early on is that um, that the d disease severity, um, as basically the, when the disease, disease gets more severe, the diversity of the bacterial community goes down and it's actually um, becomes dominated by Staphylococcus and very specifically Staphylococcus aureus in this case. Um, and so what you can see is that we have controls on the far left. So those are kids that don't have atopic dermatitis. And while they do have um, some Staphylococcus shown in, in pink, um, you can see in the bottom, in the B portion, um, that most of them are kind of, it's this blue color, which is Staphylococcus epidermidis. Um, but if you look at the atopic dermatitis patients, first of all, they, they show huge flares of staph as they go through disease states. Um, and that staph is largely Staphylococcus aureus. Um, and so this is a big study that we did on, on really trying to understand the involvement of this one bacteria and how... Um, sort of like our discussing the cheese microbiome earlier, how there is this succession of how the microbiome changes as a function of disease state. So it goes from this being a little more, more diverse state to being almost monocolonized with Staph aureus, and then going back to being more diverse after, after the treatment is administered. Um, this was all done with amplicon sequencing. Um, this was done with metagenomics, and I, I'm just putting it up here to give you an example of we can get very similar information from metagenomics where we sequence everything in the sample. And in this study, we were really looking at, again, two important key skin species, um, Propionibacterium acnes and uh, Staphylococcus epidermidis. And what we could see is that for P. acnes, um, that uh, the P. acnes strains are very similar across a person. So um, 
within an individual, the strains that they have look similar between their, the side of their nose, their palm, their toe web, versus um, uh, Staphylococcus epidermidis, where actually the, the strains look more similar um, uh, between different body sites. So everybody's alar crease looks more similar than than it does to some other body site within that person. So these, these two different bacteria that both share the same niche, the skin essentially, have very different distributions to, to sort of within or across people. Um, so this is work that's not from our lab, it's from, um, uh, from Iran Elianov's lab, and it's, it's looking at the gut. Um, but I think it's a fascinating study and I think it's uh, an, an interesting um, uh, it's something that everybody kind of knows about, and it's, it's interesting to see that you can, you can do this in lab. And this is sort of looking at uh, yo-yo dieting. Um, and without getting into all the details of it, if you look at the sort of top panel, the, the chart on the, the right-hand side, that black line is what a sort of mouse getting normal chow looks like. And the blue line is what a mouse getting high fat diet looks like. And, and weight is the, the readout. Um, but the red line is what's really interesting, which is if you take a mouse and you put him on a high fat diet, he obviously you know, will, will gain weight as if he was on the high fat diet. If you switch him back to, to normal chow or put him on a diet, basically, the weight goes down. But then when you switch back to the high fat diet again, instead of continuing at that sort of continuous rate, uh, he jumps back up to where he would have been if he'd just been you know, eating the same high fat diet the whole time. And this is the basis behind yo-yo dieting. Um, and so why is it that, you know, when you lose weight, you just gain it all right back and, and more. Um, but the really cool thing about this is that they can show in the, in the model system at the bottom is if they take a, uh, take a fecal microbiome transmit. So if they take the stool from a mouse that's either been exposed, um, to the normal chow or this, um, this high fat diet, you can actually modulate wh where, where they sort of rebound to when you switch them to the high fat diet indicating that the, the microbiome actually almost has a memory of, um, of sort of where it needs to be, the sort of metabolic thermostat of um, where, where you're supposed to be. And so the microbiome has a, has a, a role in this, um, in, in weight gain, obesity, yo-yo dieting, all that. Um, so the last part of my talk is going to be on um, sort of bad bugs in the microbiome. And um, I don't typically like to talk about, you know, bacteria is being particularly bad or good. There, there, is, there is this sort of, um, what my, my boss calls sort of, we use the sort of words of warfare when we're describing, you know, fight, you know um, defeating bacteria or fighting bacteria. And in, in, in fact, most bacteria are actually doing good things. They're supposed to be there. But clearly there are cases like this where um, sort of our normal microbiome can be invaded by some sort of a pathogen, which can cause disease. Um, and this is a very simplified model, and I, even, even as simple as it is, I don't know if it's exactly right. You know, there, there is this idea um, in the microbiome world that, you know, microbiomes can become dysbiotic, where they don't look like they should, um, and that this makes them more vulnerable to invasion by sort of pathogens. Um, and and one, one place where that's really, um, where people are really interested in that is, is this example um, from this, this paper by uh, Tara et al., where they were looking at um, stem cell transplants. And so I'm, I've blacked out the right half of the plot just to sort of focus you for a moment. And um, what you can see is that as a function of time going from left to right, um, this, uh, this individual received a bunch of different treatments that are shown in, um, in brown. And those are conditioning treatments that are part of what they use to sort of ablate the the, the bone marrow to make them so that they'll be able to receive the, the stem cell transplant. Um, and so they received a lot of different conditioning regimens, and then they received a whole lot of antibiotics, which t completely disrupts the microbiome. So you can see by the time you get to the middle of the slide there, uh, the microbiome of this individual is almost completely uh, this kind of shade of green, um, which is um, en enterobacteriaceae, um, which is or enterobacter, which is, is not the natural state of the microbiome. Um, and so what they did was um, after the engraftment, which is when the, uh, the stem cells take, um, they basically did an auto FMT where they uh, gave this person back uh, a fecal microbiome transplant of their own, of their own banked um, stool. And you can see that it restores the microbiome. Um, and the reason that this is important is that these, these heavily dysbiotic microbiomes, microbiomes that have essentially been disrupted by heavy antibiotic usage, are 
are vulnerable to being invaded by something like Clostridium difficile, which is a, 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 a huge problem in hospitals. Um, causes a lot of problems, it's hard to get rid of. Um, and actually fecal microbiome transplants are one of the things that has, has really kind of revolutionized the treatment of, um, of Clostridium difficile infections. Um, and so this is a, a little fact sheet um, from the CDC on C. diff. Um, you'll, if you go to hospitals, you'll tend to see uh, these kinds of sheets on the doors. It's taken very seriously. Um, but, uh, and so this is, this is an example of a, of, a, of a clinical trial that was being used uh, to, to look at um, whether fecal microbiome transplants could, um, could prevent or treat recurrent diarrheal disease. Um, from Clostridium infections. And like I said, it works, but you know, shortly thereafter, uh, you, you see uh, articles like this. And in this case, um, two patients got very sick. One died from fecal microbiome transplant, and it was because of an antibiotic resistant E. coli. Um, so again, um, this isn't a hype sort of thing. This is more of a, you know, you have to be cautious how quickly you move on these sorts of things. Um, you know, FMTs are, are I think, going to show a, a lot of um, potential for treating certain things, but we have to be careful how quickly we go forward with it. Um, and last but not least, uh, these are, I'm gonna show you a, just a couple of examples of um, uh, individual microorganisms that we've looked at. And so we have a collaboration that's between um, uh, Julia again, uh, the, the Clinical Center Epidemiologist, Tara Palmore, and the Clinical Center, um, <clears throat> Microbiology and, um, and Medicine Group, uh, Karen Frank. And we've looked at uh, club sale and ammonia and a variety of other um, bacteria, primarily um, antibiotic resistant bacteria, um, specifically resistant to a, a, a class of drugs called carbapenems. Or carbapenems. And carbapenems um, are a powerful class of antibiotics that are used to treat um, you know, fairly resistant infections. And um, resistance to this class of drugs has, has become pretty widespread across the world. And so we're, we're interested in um, understanding this spread, uh, especially because um, uh, carbapenem resistance tends to be on what are called plasmids, which are small pieces of DNA that can move between bacteria. So bacteria can very quickly become resistant if they acquire these, these plasmids. Um, this is uh, carbapenemase resistance in the United States. We've kind of zoomed into the U.S. Um, it's a little bit of an older slide, but you can see pretty much everywhere in the United States has carbapenem resistance. Um, these are examples of the drugs over on the left-hand side. The, the, they basically look like um, a little bit like ampicillin or penicillin, but they're, they have all these sort of extra groups hanging off of them that um, <clears throat> make it a better antibiotic. But the mechanism of of clearing these drugs by the bacteria is the same. They basically uh, chemically cleave uh, the, the ring where I've shown um, that red um, arrow. And so uh, what we're always really interested in is this idea. So what I'm showing here is two individuals and a, and a bacteria, that, that purple circle is a plasmid. Um, you know, that's kind of the classic thing we think of. We think of a bacteria maybe got transmitted between two people. Um, but when you think of plasmids, plasmids are, are like I said, can move around. And so um, <clears throat> we have to differentiate or we have to be able to detect situations like this where a plasmid may have gotten transmitted to a different host and then that got transmitted or got transmitted to a, a surface where things like this happen. So for instance, um, a, a sink drain or a, a sink faucet. And we have to differentiate all of that from um, transmissions within the hospital from organisms that come in as patients come in. Um, and so um, one of the big, uh, you know, from all of these studies that, that us and others have done, uh, one of the big things is, you know, really screening and surveilling patients as they come into the hospital to understand what's in your hospital already so that you can detect um, transmissions and, 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 then, and then work to prevent them. Um, so this is a slide that summarizes many years of work. Um, but basically, uh, starting with a club seal and pneumonia outbreak that we studied in, in 2011, um, looking at all the plasmids associated with different um, resistant organisms in, in the years that followed that, um, looking at, at sort of what these plasmids do long term um, in, in patients that are colonized over many years, and then um, ending with uh, a, a very large scale study of what sort of lives in the plumbing systems of hospitals. 
Um, and I'm just going to give you just a couple of quick vignettes uh, that come from these studies to give you an exa some examples of what we've learned by, by sequencing these bacteria. And, um, <clears throat> and it, it, it does come back to the microbiome idea too, because we're trying to understand what's living in communities in, in the human body as well as in, in, in the environment. Um, so for instance, uh, this is an example of um, uh, two different stories from, from looking at uh, bacteria and plasmids in the environment of a hospital. Um, on the, on the left-hand side, um, it's a fairly complicated slide, but basically two patients who never shared a room together, they, they were sequentially in a room. Um, uh, the patient that was there um, in November of 2010, uh, there was a bacteria that, that associated with that patient, which uh, resided in a sink, uh, encountered a bacteria from a second patient who was there a, a, a sometime later. They swapped plasmids and in the end, uh, what we observe is this sort of combinatorial organism at the bottom that has plasmids from both organisms, from both patients. And the, the complicated part about this is that what we originally observed was this sort of com combined organism at the bottom that's labeled ECNAH2 that has three plasmids, all of which are carrying a, a carbapenemase gene. They're all carrying an antibiotic resistance gene. And we, we really had no idea when we first isolated it where all of these plasmids came from. And then we figured out, we sort of backtracked up a step and figured out this patient A had the same plasmid. So we thought, oh, well, it must have come from that, that organism, but you know, still, where did the other two plasmids come from? And only after we went back sort of into the freezer and for other purposes did we find sort of the original organism. And so this is an example of, of a bacteria staying resident in a plumbing and basically in a drain on a bio, probably a biofilm um, for a long period of time. And, and I can say that once, we, once this was discovered that the whole sink was basically pulled out and, and replaced. Um, the, on the right-hand side of your slide is, um, is an example of just looking at how the plasmids are shared between patients and, and the environment. And, and the, the take-home message of this is there are a lot of patients, there are a lot of plasmids that are only ever observed in patients or the environment, not both. And there's actually not very much overlap in between there, um, which means that, you know, a, a lot of the organisms that are in the patient population are getting into the, into the environment, and most of the plasmids that are in the environment are not making it back into patients. Um, there's actually very few that, that span both, um, both environments. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is something that we're getting really interested in lab. It's actually a fungus um, called uh, Candida auris. Um, it's, it's popping up sort of all over, all over the world and then all over the United States. Um, it has, um, it's, it's what you're seeing here is uh, sort of a phylogenetic breakdown of how they're related to each other using um, their the, their genome sequences. Um, and, but the, 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 the key take home of this is that different clades of this particular fungus are being found all over the United States in Canada, Illinois, um, the, the sort of Northeast, uh, Florida, and they belong to these different clades. There's a lot of work right now trying to track and understand the spread of this organism. And the reason for that is that um, Candida auris has some, um, has some really um, worrying properties. Um, uh, there are fungal species that, of Candida auris or strains of Candida auris that are resistant to all three major antifungal drugs, so they're very hard to treat. Um, they can colonize skin asymptomatically, um, but then they can also enter the bloodstream and cause disease. Um, and this is particularly true in cases of patients that have uh, other comorbidities like diabetes or obesity or being bedridden. Um, they can persist on environmental surfaces, including bed rails and, and, and windowsills. Um, and they're, they're, again, they're, they're sort of, they're causing outbreaks in these, um, in these areas that are very vulnerable populations. So these would be things like long-term care facilities and nursing homes. So, um, this is, this is something that we're actually studying actively right now, um, trying to understand it, um, and trying to understand how the microbiome, you know, is there something about the microbiome that predisposes somebody to becoming can uh, colonized with candida auris, either the fungal microbiome or the bacterial microbiome. Um, and some of our work is beginning to bear out some, some, um, uh, some conclusions about that. Um, and then I, I, the last point I hear, it's listed as one of the world's 10 most feared fungi, even though it's only been a, really studied for the last few years. Um, these are just some more, um, some more notes on um, uh, sort of popular, you know, both 
the medical and popular literature on this uh, on this organism. So, um, so my final thoughts on on this talk is that you know while it's the most famous, the human microbiome isn't the only microbiome. There's lots of environmental microbiomes. I didn't talk about it at all, but there's a huge literature on what's called the built microbiome, what lives in and on surfaces in, in homes and in offices, even in the space station. Um, over and over again, I can't stress enough that correlation is not causation. We tend to, we tend to when we're doing these experiments, look at um, a disease state or a phenotype or an observation, and we try to look at, at whether the microbiome is involved in that, and oftentimes we do see changes in the microbiome. But it, it takes, you know, it, it, making that observation is almost the easy part. Um, coming back in and, and figuring out if the microbiome is actually driving that change is, is much harder science. Um, and that's where most people get tripped up when they overhype the microbiome is not understanding correlation is not causation. Um, and finally, you know, microbial communities are complex multifaceted systems. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're difficult to study, but... Um, uh, we're starting to get a handle on it. We're starting to understand how we can intervene with things like um, uh, fecal microbiome transplants. Um, we're starting to understand how um, how organisms, um, how how communities change as a function of other organisms come in using studies like the the, the cheese microbiome, where we're trying to understand um, how they how they change or how they respond to other organisms being put into the into the community, and how these how these um, communities are. Um, modified by what we eat, the drugs we take, um, antibiotics, all those sorts of things. And with that, um, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Okay. We get to go, Alvaro. <clears throat> All right. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. That was awesome. Um, Bellin just.